invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And as you're turning, remember, we mentioned on Sunday evening, June the 8th, we're having that special potluck, and then Katie Karcher is going to be sharing with us about Legal Shield, a very important evening. Be sure to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the foyer coming up in a couple weeks. What's happening next Sunday? We're moving to two services. So we're looking forward to it, 8.30 and 10.45. We still need some of you to step up and volunteer in some of the key areas. We need volunteers to help collect the offering at the second service. So be sure to sign up for that in the foyer if you'd like to do that for about a month's period of time. And we're also in need of someone to help with the little children at least during the first service. So think about which one you're going to attend, the first or second, and hopefully you could uh, end up in some area of service. Be praying for that. And I want you to know as well, next week we end our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is making a big push in the last words for making the right decision for eternity. So if you have a friend, a neighbor, or a relative that is unsaved, this would be, at least from our Lord's perspective, an excellent sermon for them to hear. So begin to pray about that and think who you'd like to invite next week, either to the 8.30 or 10.45 service. Today's text will be Matthew 7, verses 7 to 12, and we're going to examine this section after we look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Savior lives. We thank you for the fact that... Uh, all other religions teach about followers and teach about leaders who have died, who no longer exist. We serve a living Savior, a resurrected Lord, who is here in our midst today, and a God who listens to us when we pray. And that's going to be one of our thoughts in today's section of Scripture today. And we pray that you will help us to see some new ways and some new insights about communicating to you, understanding your grace, and then taking the grace that we've been given from heaven and sharing it with the people we come in contact with every single day. Let that message come home to us today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. A Japanese Christian said on his first trip to the United States, attending a worship service and prayer circles, he was really shocked by the directness of Americans' prayers. He said the American prayer actually resembles a person who goes to Burger King and orders a Whopper, well done, a hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, and extra ketchup, please. That's the way Americans pray. He says the Japanese is more like the tourist who walks into a foreign restaurant unable to read the menu. And he finally communicates by means of gestures and a phrase book that he would like the house specialty. And he waits for the specialty to come. Now, really, in a sense, that Eastern approach to prayer involves more trust as well as more suspense and adventure because you never know what you're going to get. You allow the host to determine the answer to your request. You know, we can trust our Heavenly Father because He gives freely to members of His family the finest gifts on His menu of grace. Amen? And the Bible says they're all good. Notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 11 of Matthew 7. How much more will your Father who's in heaven give what is what? Good to those who ask Him. He is a good God. And when He gives out of His grace, we're touched in our hearts, and we're so moved by His mercy that we're motivated to offer kindness to others. And that, in a sense, sets up the theme of today's text. It works like this. The text starts with our need in verses 7 to 8. It moves to God's nature in verses 9 to 10. 
and it ends with our neighbor in verse 12. So once again, we start with our need, we move to God's nature, and then we end with our neighbor. That's the way Jesus flows this section of Scripture. The whole process starts with our need. And when it comes to our need, the Bible says we are to pray persistently. Pray persistently. Look at verses 7 and 8. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Now that sounds simple and straightforward, doesn't it? Ask, and it will be given to you. It appears to be a carte blanche statement. God gives you a blank check. Anything you ask for, it comes. Is it that simple? I'm not sure about that. I don't think it's that obvious. It's like the wife who's sick in home, and when a wife is sick in the house, pandemonium reigns in the kitchen. And she's in bed, and she's in desperate need of some tea, and the husband is rummaging through the kitchen cupboards to find the tea, and finally in frustration he says, Honey, I can't find the tea. Where do you keep it? And she shouts from the bedroom, I don't know why you can't find it. It's right in front on the cupboard shelf, in a cocoa tin marked matches. <laughs> it's not always as obvious as we like it to be, and neither is the statement that Jesus is making. Please do not get the impression from these words that God is a celestial vending machine into which you drop the quarters of life, pull the lever, and your prayer is instantly answered. I wish it was that way, but the context of the Bible says there are some requirements to getting our needs met. And I want to share them with you today. One requirement is Psalm 6618. Psalm 6618 says, If I regard sin in my heart, God won't hear my prayer. I don't care if some preacher, I don't care if some evangelist, I don't care if some parent told you God hears all prayers, they lied to you. That's almost blasphemous. It's anti-scripture. The Bible says God cannot and will not hear anything I have to pray if I know there's bitterness, if I know there's resentment, or there's a particular sin I'm harboring in my heart. So that's one request or one issue that has to be dealt with before God hears our prayer. Just one. Here's another one that husbands do not like, but it's in the Bible. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, you treat your wives tenderly, or God will cut off your prayers. The husband who is mean to his wife is wasting all of his breath in praying. God doesn't hear it. I wish there was one like that for the wives, but there's not. Just the husbands. I'm sorry. God must love women more than he loves men. What can I say? James 4, 3. You ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives to spend it on your personal pleasures. Oh, boy, there's another reason I'll get my answers uh, given to me at God. How about this one? Proverbs 28, 9. The one who turns his ear, his ear away from listening to God's word... You don't care when the Word of God is preached. You're listening or you're looking at the ground or you're sleeping and doing something else. God says he will not hear your prayer. It's, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? God goes, you don't want to hear me? I'm not going to hear you. So don't ever treat this lightly when it's taught or preached. Pay attention. Take it in. That is, if you want God to hear you. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then we have the statement, in 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have from God that if we ask anything, he hears it, if we ask according to his will. You say, what's his will? We've already shared what his will is. First of all, his will is stated in the verses I've shared and in this sermon on the mount. Proverbs 28, 9. We have to be obedient to God's law and pay attention to it if we want him to hear us. And Jesus taught us that in Matthew 5, 17 to 48, 
about the importance of respecting the law and the word of God. Um, James 4.3 says, if I'm asking just so I could spend it on moi and meet my needs, God won't hear that. And that's pretty much what Jesus said back in Matthew 6.24. If you're serving money, you can't serve God, and he's not going to meet those needs of your life. And then we were told in Psalm 66.18 that I can't keep sin in my heart and expect God to hear me. And what did Jesus tell us at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 3 to 6? Blessed are those who are sad over their sin. Happiness in life comes when you own your own sin. And then we looked at that verse that husbands don't like from 1 Peter 3, 7, that you have to treat your wife properly if you want a connection with God. And that swings us back to what we examined last week in chapter 7 and verse 1, when he said what? Don't judge lest you be judged. If I'm hard on you, God will be hard on me. So those are kind of the prerequisites to keep in mind. Whenever you step into any statement of the scripture which suggests, just ask, God will give you. He will provided you keep his word in context. Now, God wants to hear our prayers if we ask properly, and that's what I've just shared with you, and secondly, if we ask persistently. That's a very important point. And you kind of caught that, didn't you, from the text? You have to ask, you have to seek, you have to knock. Now, those are not statements, ask, seek, knock. They are present imperatives in the Greek, which are continuous commands. So it says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. When do you stop asking, seeking, and knocking? When you get the answer and not until. Pray again and 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 again. And then again and again and again. And you keep on doing it. God, you say, why do we do that? We don't do that to people. Drives them nuts. God's different. He wants to see our persistence. You know what God's looking for in my life and yours? He's looking for pit bull tenacity in prayer. And he illustrates that numerous times in the New Testament. Hold your finger here. Turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. I want you to see it as Jesus is talking on the subject of prayer. Hold your finger, Matthew 7. Turn to Luke 11. 7-11. Luke 11, right after Mark is Luke, the 11th chapter, verses 5 to 7. He, that's Jesus in verse 5, said to them, the disciples, suppose one of you has a friend, he goes to him at midnight, and he says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answered and says, don't bug me. The door has been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. The way Jesus phrases it, he pictures a peasant's cottage where everyone slept on one floor next to each other to stay warm in one room. And so he gets a knock on the door, and the man is saying, now listen, i got to stumble over the wife, wake up the kids, disturb the baby, take the bolt off the door, light the candle, it's 3 in the morning, are you nuts? It's too much, I'm not going to do it, go away. That's the response of the friend who doesn't want to answer the request. Now I want you to notice, the word friend was used twice. We saw that, right? But in verse 7, when this man responds to him, he does not employ the word friend. He doesn't treat him like a friend. He treats him like an irritant. You're bugging me. You know why he does? Because no one, including your pastor, likes being woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, do they? It's not fun to be woken out of sleep. There was a very gracious neighbor who at one point at 4 in the morning received a ringing phone call, and he lifted the receiver to his ear and said, hello, and the voice said, 
Your dog is barking and it's keeping me awake. Well, the man thanked the caller politely and then asked what his name was. And then he hung up. The next morning at 4 o'clock, he called the man back and said, Sir, I don't have a dog. Click. Oh. <laughs> That's brilliant. And I'm sure that this neighbor would have loved to return the favor the next night by pounding on his buddy's door, saying, You bring out the pita bread. My friend has arrived. Get you right back. But there's nothing in the parable that suggests that. In fact, the refusal gives way to what we call the reconsideration. Take a look at verses 8 to 10 of Luke 11. Jesus says, I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, his bulldog tenacity, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And so I say to you, ask, it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened. Deja vu. We just saw those, didn't we? The exact same statement Jesus made maybe a year or so before in Matthew chapter 7. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Again, present imperatives. Again, in Luke, constant commands. Again, this is the way God wants us to pray. I know from personal experience, and if some of you have been in prayer for years, you know as well, that there are times in which God purposely withholds our requests from us, doesn't he? He will hold them back for weeks, for months, for years, for decades. Because he wants to see if we really, really want it. You say, I wish he didn't do that. I do too. But I'm not God. That's how God operates. And that's how he tells us to pray again and again and again because he tells us to be like children. Think about a child. If a mother is near, he will ask. If he can't find her, what will he do? He will go from room to room. He will seek. And when he discovers that mother can't take him anymore and she's locked herself in the bathroom, <laughs> does he give up? Mommy, 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 mommy. Know how that drives you crazy? Doesn't drive Jesus bad at all. Father, 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 father. He's okay with it. He is not irritated by your persistence in mine. Don't think that, well, you know, God knows my need. I can just toss it up once and walk away. God goes, you toss it up once and walk away, I'll walk away. I want you to stay in relationship with me. I want you to learn to trust me when you don't get it. I want you to learn to ask in different ways. I want to see your persistence. And so that's the way he tells us to pray. Why? Because he delights in our determination. He wants to see how badly we want it. Think of the farmer and his wife who uh, went to the fair. And they uh, were really amazed by the plane rides at the fair, as the guy was doing loops in the air and all these tricks, but they complained about the $75 tickets apiece, and they just balked and complained and whined and whined, and the pilot couldn't take it anymore. He said, now listen, I'll tell you what, if you two could get on this plane and you could take the ride without making a single sound, a single complaint, I'll let you ride scot-free. But if you open your mouth one time, you both pay double the rate. And the cheap farmer said, deal. And he shook his hand. They got in the plane, did the loops, flew back. And the pilot, not looking back, just landing, said, I can't even believe it. If I had not been in the plane, I wouldn't have believed it. You two never made a single sound. The farmer said it wasn't easy either. I almost yelled when my wife fell out. <laughs> That's perseverance. He wanted to save the buck. And Jesus wants to see that kind of passion and perseverance in our prayer life as well. I am latching on, and I'm going to...
get this and I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to keep going and going and talking and talking and praying and praying till God comes through. And that's the way to pray, Jesus says. We pray persistently our need. Now we notice God's nature. Secondly, the reason we pray persistently is because God gives graciously. God gives graciously. Verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, he will give him a stone? Even a bad dad won't deceive his son by giving him a rock that resembles a piece of bread. Not even the worst of dads, I believe. Verse 10. If he asks for a fish, will he not give him a snake instead? Now listen, the snake could be cooked to look like meat, and the snake, when it's cooked, will provide the son with some physical nourishment but the problem is Leviticus 11.12 tells us that every Jew knew that Jesus was speaking to that the, lake, the uh, snake was unclean food. Why was it unclean? Because of what happened in Eden, because of the garden. And so what he's saying here is simply this. No Jewish dad is going to deceive and defile his son ceremonially and play games and tricks with his physical and spiritual needs. That's what he's saying. Jesus says no dad is going to play tricks with the physical and the spiritual needs of his child. If you then, verse 11, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, please note the first words of Jesus that the vast people in society and all of our educators do not believe in today. What is that? If you then being good by nature. That's what teachers teach. Lie, lie, lie. People are not good by nature. The creator says, I'm not only affirming it, I'm insisting that you get it. You are evil by nature. I am evil by nature. I will lie or rationalize to get out of a sin when I'm convicted. I will think of you only when I've thought of me first. This is the evil part of human beings. Even Christians, even saints, even those who are saved and root to heaven still do evil things according to Jesus. But if you, driven by selfish or evil natures, will tend to give good gifts to the kids you love, well, then he says, how much more so? How much more so will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? You say, but I've been asking him, and he hasn't given it to me. You know why? Because you're not asking for bread and fish. You're asking for a stone or a snake. And you think it's good for you, but God says, I'm your Father in heaven who loves you. And I know that it will harm you, and I'm concerned about your welfare more than I am about your comfort and ease. Now, my grandson, Logan, from the age of one and a half, was absolutely in love with my Toyota Camry. If I, went out to, if I went out to polish it, he wanted to help me polish it. If I was washing the wheels, he wanted to help me wash the wheels. And he couldn't wait to get in that car behind the wheel and pretend like he was driving. And I'd let him do that in the driveway. He'd put him up there, and I'd let him move the wheel so he's commandeering it down the highway. And occasionally I'd discover when I would take a trip down the freeway, I would let him sit on my lap and drive the car. I'm just kidding. That never happened. Okay. <laughs> but I would let him sit behind the wheel and actually help him to maneuver the car from the driveway into the garage so he felt like he really drove. Now, what if now, at the age of six, he approached me and said, you know, Papa, I just want to drive down the street to my friend's house to visit him for an hour. Could I please have the keys? Well, even if he used that magic word, Papa, the answer would always be no. Why? Because I'm concerned about his ultimate welfare. He's asking for a stone or a snake. 
and some single people ask that God would give them that special one to marry and then grab an individual and that's a stone or a snake. And some Christians pray a quick prayer, God bless this decision and jump into an occupation that was never God's will because the occupation pulls them away from worship on Sundays. And some people make foolish decisions when it comes to purchasing a home or purchasing a car or doing that. And they really didn't talk to God about it. They just shot up a quick prayer and jumped in and they asked for a stone or a snake. That's why it's better just to wait and to watch this bathe, bathe, drown everything in prayer. Put it under for a long time and really seek to ask the will of God. And when he gives it to you, it will be what is good and not what is bad. We don't always know what we think we need. We know we, what we think we need, but we are not aware of what we truly need. Max Lucado writes, when my oldest daughter was six, we were having a discussion about my job. She wasn't very happy with my chosen profession. She wanted me to leave the pastorate. I like you as a preacher, she said, but Daddy, what I really wish is that you sold snow cones. <laughs> now that's an honest request, he writes, from a pure heart. Made sense to her that the happiest people in the world are men who drove the snow cone trucks. Play music, sell the goodies, make kids happy. More, what more could you want? Max writes, come to think about it, she may have a point. I could get a loan, buy a truck, not nah, eat too much. <laughs> I heard her request, did I heed it? Of course not. Why? As her dad, I knew better. I know what I'm called to do, I know what I need to do, and I know more about what she needs in her life than she does. Guess who else knows? Far more about what you need than you think you need. You're God in heaven. And I know from personal experience, and all of you do as well, that God does not always give us what we ask for. But in the end, what he gives us is good, good, good. I like the wisdom of a Confederate soldier. He wrote this in the Civil War. I asked God for strength that I might achieve I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given sickness that I might do better things. I asked for riches so I could be happy. I was given poverty so I could be wise. I asked for power so I could have the praise of men. I was given weakness so I could feel a need for God. I asked for all things so I could enjoy life, and I was given life so I could enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for, I am among all men most richly blessed. Pretty good, isn't it? So we pray persistently. That's our need. God gives graciously. That's God's nature. And now, point three, our neighbor, we treat others tenderly. We treat others tenderly. Check out the last verse of our text. In everything, what does everything mean? Everything. Therefore, Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. Wow. The word therefore swings us back to the context, the immediate context. Verse 11, God's been good to me, right? I'm good to thee, verse 12. I've received it, now I reveal it to you. Hasn't this been one of the key themes in the Sermon on the Mount? You're wondering, what does God want from my life? How does he want me to deal with that cantankerous person? How do I handle individuals that I don't see eye to eye with? Jesus has told us so many times it's not even funny in the Sermon on the Mount. 
He is just summing up right here what he's been saying week after week after week after week after week after week so that we finally get it. He told us in chapter 5, in verse 5, blessed are the gentle, the gentle in their relationships with others. Chapter 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, the merciful people. Those are the ones who are going to be happy. Chapter 5, 24, reconcile a relationship if it's broken. That party may not want the reconciliation. That's okay. You make the call. You send the letter. You do your part, and you be kind to them. That's your job. Reconcile the relationship. Chapter 5, verse 44, love your enemies. Chapter 6, verse 15, if I don't forgive you, God won't forgive me. Chapter 7, verse 1, don't judge lest you be judged. So I think we get the point, don't we? And Jesus sums it up by saying, treat others tenderly. Now, here's what amazes me, and, and we miss this today. Jesus says, if I treat you tenderly and decently, then verse 12 says, I have obeyed the law and the prophets. That is a statement that sums up every single jot and tittle in the entire Old Testament. Now, if you read Leviticus and Exodus, in fact, if you haven't done it, do it this week, you'll be overwhelmed by the rules, the regulations, the rituals, and the commandments. Newsflash. If you will just love people, you forget all the rest of that stuff. Jesus has simplified life down into a very easy way to understand. Life is not about rules and regulations. Life is not about procedures and schedules and demands that you make of people. Now, you may be operating your ministry in the church like that, you may be acting like that in your home with your spouse or your children and you've missed the boat and you're wondering why you're so stressed out all the time. It's because you have missed life. Life has never been about rules and regulations. If it was, he would have executed David after he did his deed with Bathsheba and Uriah. He would have killed Moses on the spot. But God didn't do that because it's not about rules and rituals and regulations. It's about relationships. You could simplify life in your family. You could simplify life at the place in which you're employed. You could simplify life with the person who lives next to you. And you could simplify life in your ministry in the church if you just give rules and regulations and procedures a break for a year or how about 50 years. And just try loving on people. Because when you're loving on people, guess what they're going to do? They're going to love back and they're going to say, what's your desire? Well, I wish you'd do that. Okay, I'll do it. Wow, is that easy? Yeah, it was that easy. Because you didn't force me. You didn't demand me. You didn't put it down in print. You didn't insist upon me. You didn't bring out the slap or the strap. You just loved me through it. Dean Cornish, who is a world-renowned cardiologist, agrees with Jesus. Here's what Dean says. If you're loving God and treating people well, this is a heart specialist, you could eat junk food and remain healthy. This is why there are people who eat healthy food and are ready for a heart attack because they can't get along with anyone else. Wasn't it, uh, who is the prime minister of England? Winston Churchill. He ate poorly, he smoked cigars, he drank whiskey every day of his life, and he died suddenly at the age of 92. You know why? 
because he had great relationships around him with his family and his friends. It's all about relationships. And Dean Ornish makes this statement. Watch this. We are 500% more likely to contract a major illness when we're isolated from loving people. You want a heart attack? You want an aneurysm? You want cancer? I'll tell you how to get it. Pull away from the church. Don't spend time with your kids or your spouse. Just lock yourself away, and that will be the gift to you. We were born to be in relationship. We have a God who's a relational God. He's the triune God. That's why Jesus cried, why have you forsaken me? Because it was the first time in all of eternity he wasn't connected with the Father. We break connections from people all the time. God never breaks connections from the Trinity. He's always connected. And we're made in his image. We're made to be connected. He wants us to be relational people. He wants us to be loving others. And then he says, if you want to know how to love others, it's very, very simple. Just do for them what you want done for you. You don't need to read a book or attend a seminar that may assist you, but you don't need that. Just think, what do I want in my life? And then give it to others. Amen. It's just that simple. See their perspective all of us when we're overwhelmed, right? Don't want people to add more burdens to us, do we? We want them to be patient with us and tender with us. But we're not like that with others. I read about a lady named Dolores driving a country road. Noticed a car was following, you know, right there on the rear, blinking the lights, honking the horn, putting pressure on her, and there was nowhere for her to turn off. She had no way, the other driver, to know that Dolores was transporting 100 pounds of mashed potatoes, two crockpots full of gravy, and all kinds of food supplies for a church social to feed 200 people. And seeing the driver's frustration, she thought, if she just realized the load that I'm carrying, she would understand the way I'm driving. And no sooner had that thought escaped her mind than a second thought came. How often, Lord, am I impatient with people when I have no idea of the fragile load they are carrying? Amen. Yeah. So think about yourself first. Sounds selfish, it's not. Think about yourself. What do I need from people? And that's the way to live your life. Let's phrase it another way. Do you like it when people lambast you for your mistakes? No. Hmm. Do you like it when people talk, 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 your ear off and ever shut that hole in their face to listen? You don't like that one? Interesting. Very interesting. Do you like it when folks are arrogant and out of it and unbending? It's my way or the highway. You don't like that? Then don't toss that trash out to others, Jesus says today. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you what I like. I like it when people forgive my failures. Yes. I like it when people respect my decision even if they disagree with it. I think after 40, or actually close to 50 years in the ministry, I've earned that. Everyone else doesn't think that, but I think that way. Okay. <laughs> and the third one is very easy. And I get angry when it doesn't happen sometimes. I like it when I'm smiling and nice to others, and they're smiling and nice to me. Now, that's my likes. That's what I want. Now, it's your turn. I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak out. I'm going to start the sentence, and you fill in the blank. Don't go lengthy, just short like I did. I like it when people, what? 
Listen. Say thank you. That's real short. You could go a little bit longer than that, but thank you, ladies, for respecting what I said. Okay. Yes. Have grace. Have grace. Oh, good, good. Anything else? What do you like? How many people want? You're very easy. You don't need anything. Huh? <laughs> Anyone else? When people are patient. Oh, yes. They're helpful, patient, gracious, forgiving. Anything else? Consider it. They trust where they, 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 they give you the word. They keep the word. Yes. Okay. Yes. They're kind hearted. Yes. See, these are all the same themes. You've all chosen synonyms based on what you've been studying in the last several months. Maybe you didn't know that. This is what Jesus has been teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of this underflow of kindness and goodness and grace. Now, we need to get it in order, we need to give it in order to get it. Amen. But we have to start the process. There was a policeman named Roy who was in the habit of dropping in an elderly gentleman who lived in a 5,000 square foot mansion overlooking a river. It was a beautiful setup. The older man had lived there almost all of his life and he cherished the wonderful view and the trees and the water. Roy would check in on him a couple times a week, and they'd have some tea, and they'd stroll the gardens and go down to the river. One visit was a sad one, because the man admitted, my health is failing. I have to sell my home and move to a nursing home. That broke Roy's heart for two reasons. For a selfless reason, number one, he liked the old man. Number two, for a selfish reason, he really enjoyed the house, he wouldn't be able to go there anymore. And he thought, man, I'd love to have that house. But he looked at it, he realized there's no way that I could afford it. Now, the man wanted for this 5,000 square foot house, $300,000. Does that tell you it was not in Southern California? Yes, okay, all right. Roy had $3,000 in savings, and he was paying $500 rent at the time. Now, this was an insurmountable issue. There is no way in the world he could come up with an idea in which they could both win until you take into account the power of love. Roy said, what are you going to miss the most about your home? He said, well, walking through the garden and enjoying the beauty of this location. Roy said, I'll tell you what. If you let me buy your house, I promise to pick you up twice a month and spend several hours with you on those Sunday afternoons, enjoying the house and the gardens and walking down to the river. And the man just lit up, and he said to Roy, you write up whatever offer seems right to you, and I'll sign it. Roy offered all he could afford. The purchase price was $300,000, and the down payment, $3,000. The vendor took back a $297,000 first mortgage, bearing interest at $500 a month, and that's what he paid. And the old man was so happy as a present, he gave Roy all the antique furniture plus the baby grand piano. And Roy thought, you know something? I'm the one who won in this deal. And you know what the old man thought? I'm the one who won in this deal. And so what am I leaving you with today? I'm leaving you with this line. In every relationship on earth, ask yourself, how could I make this a win-win proposition? How can we both win? Edwin Markham, who was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln put it this way. There is a destiny that makes us brothers. No one goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. Let's bow together. At the cross, God created a win-win condition. It was wonderful. Jesus died 
so that your sins could be forgiven. That way you win. Jesus died so God could enjoy you forever in heaven. That way he wins. Isn't that a great deal? Have you accepted the deal? Have you signed on the dotted line? Could you remember a specific point in time when you recognize that you, like Jesus has said, are evil by nature? And you sin, whether sometimes you want to or not, you just do it. You're imperfect. But there's a Father in heaven who longs to be with you and wants to enjoy your presence throughout eternity. All he asks for you today is to acknowledge the fact that you've come short of the standard of excellence and you want a relationship with him. Are you willing to do that? If so, then when every head is bowed and eyes are closed, I just ask you to lift your hand good and high, and by doing so, you'd say, Pastor, I'd like you to pray for me right now so that I could step into the family of God by faith. If that's your desire, just raise your hand. Father, we want to thank you for the fact that you have provided the ultimate plan to make everyone pleased. You go for the win-win proposition. And we recognize that in some of our relationships on this earth that people don't want to meet us halfway. We call them, they will not answer our phone calls. We write them or text them or email them and they won't respond to us. That's okay, as long as we've done our part. Help us to be honest about doing our part at all times, to reach out in love, and to make every situation a win-win proposition. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our worship team will come up at this time as we stand for our final song today.